we get started, I, I'm gonna be honest, I am so unbelievably nervous, I feel like I'm gonna throw up my heart. So, not too much prayer is, is like, it's okay to pray too much, so we're gonna, please pray with me. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just wanted to thank you um, for the opportunity to just get up here and share your story, to share um, just beautiful things about you, Jesus. Um, and I just pray that today, that people do not see me whatsoever. And I pray that people see how unbelievably beautiful you are. God, I pray you just speak through me and just allow it to be the things that you want said to be said. God, and just soften our heart and hearts to hear what it is you want us to hear. Move in this room, God, for the sole purpose to give you the glory. Move in this room for the sole purpose for you just to be seen. God, you are so unbelievably awesome. And thank you for letting little me get up here and talk about big old you. God, you're awesome. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I wanted to kick it off today um, with this wonderful and equally terrifying thing called transparency. And I wanted to admit something to you guys. I, Jordan Noel Reese, I'm addicted to Instagram. And I know how unbelievably middle school of me, but let me just tell you I'm really like addicted to Instagram. And it's not uncommon for me to like lay down to go to sleep at 11 and have every intention of getting a full like eight hours of sleep. And it's not uncommon for me to stay up until two and just look through the world of Instagram, the intricate webbing of pictures of you like with your Starbucks screen or your artsy selfies in the bathroom. like. Trust me, if you're my friend on Instagram, I probably stalked you at least three times. So I'm just, I'm just saying. So yeah, I, Jordan Noel Reese, am absolutely addicted to Instagram. And you best know that after spending so much time on one form of social media that I have grown to love one day of the week. Um, and if you're on Instagram or on any form of social media, this day is called um, hashtag Transformation Tuesday. And if you're unfamiliar with the language of hashtags, basically Transformation Tuesday is just a day where people willingly put up pic old pictures, embarrassing pictures of themselves up on social media compared to a new picture, just to show how they've transformed over the years, to show how they're different. So there you have it, Transformation Tuesday. So today, in honor of my shameless addiction and this day of the week that brings me laughter and joy, I want to introduce Hashtag transformation, it's really Friday, but for sermon illustration purposes, we're just gonna pretend that it's Tuesday, Tuesday. And so, I know, it's, it's a pretty awesome hashtag, but I, I asked around like to professors and students, and I asked around like, hey, who of you have just this awesome, like old embarrassing photo of you? And I got tons of responses. Like you guys went through some awkward stages in your life, let me tell you. So I'm gonna go ahead like, and share a couple of these with you, a couple of your beloved professors and fellow students who, um, who've been through quite a transformation. Um, the first person or couple that I'd like to introduce, uh, Dave and Kristen Miller. Aw, like her name is cute, right? Like we all know Dave, we all know Kristen, um, but we don't know Dave and Kristen Miller, Afro plus mullet, if you will show the next picture. <laughs> the two of them have transformed them <laughs> quite, quite a bit. Um, the next person who has willingly submitted a photo is the awesome Reed Milliken. So round of applause to Reed. And so yeah, um, new Reed, uh, if you want to go ahead and put up British boy band Reed. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I get to say these things because they're the ones who told me them. So. Um, next person, go ahead and throw that one up there. Oh, couple, I'm sorry. Cutest couple on campus. We all love Brandon and Alicia. Oh, so cute. Okay, now, let's see the old pictures of the two. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, I didn't, I went to Alicia, and I'm like, Alicia, do you have any old embarrassing photos of you? And she's like, yeah, you know, I do. And she's like, but. I have this photo of Brandon that you have to see. <laughs> and 
she showed me cam camo pants, Brandon, with spiked up hair, and I lost it in the library. Brandon walks in and she's like, what are you talking about? And Melissa's like, I showed her that picture. And he's like, and I'm like, Brandon, can I use that in chapel in front of the entire student body, please? And he's like, I guess. Like, <laughs> and so last but not least, our next person, the lovely Christy Dent, of course. And then Christy Dent. like, let me look and see what I have. I'll check out Facebook. And then she sent me an email with this picture and I literally typed out like 20 million ha 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 ha. Because it was, made me laugh so hard and I'm like, thank you for allowing me to get up in front of the entire student body, show this picture and make fun of you. And she emailed me back saying, well, when you put it that way, dot, dot, dot. And so, of course, I can't make fun of you all and not make fun of myself. So this is an old picture of me that I'd like to show you. <laughs> went at a like 50 degree angle and I really thought that fuzzy turtleneck was really cool. Like do you know those fuzzy socks that everyone gifts you because like they don't know what else to get you like that are super awesome that I was wearing a fuzzy sock sweater form. And like yeah and my mom cut my bangs so if you want a good haircut my mom she'll, she'll give you one but it's, it, it's just funny when we can see a transformation take place. It's funny to me. Um, as I shuffle through like every old embarrassing photo of me in the tote that's in my basement, I just can't help but think back to like the person that I used to be, right? Um, I remember when I was younger, I honestly thought that Nick Jonas would make eye contact with me at one of his concerts and fall in love with me. <laughs> like I was a convinced middle school girl that I would someday marry Nick Jonas. I, Halloween was my favorite. <laughs> Halloween was my favorite season because of the fact that ABC Family played Hocus Pocus like every single hour of every single day. I loved it. I used to fight my parents tooth and nail um, about the fact that I never will like goulash. Never, no matter how many times I try just one more bite, I will hate it. And I honestly can tell you that to this day I hate goulash with every fiber of my being. And then I, you know, I got a little bit older and my problems shifted from my too early bedtime. And then I got older and I started to realize that I, I cared how I looked. And I cared how people saw me. And then I started to care a little. And then I started to care a little too much. And then I started to care a lot too much. And before I knew it, I was a middle school girl who was constantly comparing myself to those around me. I compared, I compared, I compared, I compared, and I never, ever matched up to the comparison. I was never pretty enough, I was never popular enough, I was never interesting enough. Um, boys ignored me, like I had great friends, but I always looked at the table of like popular girls and I asked myself, what am I doing wrong? And it sounds, oh, so middle school of me, right, to care about such things, but I did. I cared so greatly how other people viewed me and myself that middle school and in the beginning stages of high school was a complete blur to me. All I can remember is getting ready in the dark because I could not stand my reflection. I remember just sitting and crying because I was so exhausted with, with not liking who I was. And it was so silly of me, right, to struggle with self-esteem. Everyone struggles with self-esteem, but it was detrimental. My story up until that point in my life was completely hopeless. And I was chasing, I was chasing, I was running. And it seemed that my story was heading towards this, this bad ending. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was hopeless. I was chasing, 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 and I was out of breath because I didn't know what I was chasing. I didn't know what it was I was looking for. I thought that maybe if I, if I just did this with the way I looked, then maybe I'd be happy. But it just kept me on this never-ending cycle and this never-ending path. I was fed up and I was out of breath. I was ultimately hopeless. Looking back at my life, I, re I realized that a lot has changed from those awkward prepubescent elementary and middle school years. A lot has changed. And it's been more than simply the braces coming off, the fuzzy turtlenecks being burned, and, and haircuts from mom nicely but hastily turned down. I have been transformed by hope by love, by a man who took the time to sit down next to me, tell me everything about myself, 
and then in the most loving and beautiful way possible, tell me that I can be free and I can have access to a life free from the things that ruin my reflection in the mirror. A man who gently, calmly set me down and say, this is how you've been living, but this is how you could live. I want to share a story with you guys today from scripture. Um, another story that just tells a really powerful, um, tells a powerful uh, story of a woman, a nameless woman, mind you, who was transformed. A woman who was transformed by hope. A woman who is transformed by love. A woman transformed by a man who took the time to sit down next to her, tell her everything about herself, and show her that she can indeed have a life that's free. Will you guys join me in John 4 today with Jesus at a well? So here Jesus is, right? He um, is just leaving Judea and is on his way to Galilee. Him and his ragtag group of disciples um, are making this journey. But here's the thing. Samaria was in between the locations that they, were, they wanted to get to, right? And as a Jew, you didn't go through Samaria. You did not go through Samaria because Samaritans were looked down on. Samaritans were shunned. You just didn't do that. So what Jews would do is they would take a much longer route around Samaria so that they wouldn't have to go through it. Do you guys remember as children how like there was that one house um, on your way from home from the bus stop, that one house that you would do all that you possibly could to avoid, right? Like there, the lawn was overgrown, there was tire, like spare tires in the car for some unknown reason, like a collection of really creepy lawn gnomes. Like you did all that you could to avoid it. And if it wasn't the, the yard that got you, it was like the, the owner of the house who would just sit on his porch and his like cut off Joe's Crab Shack t-shirt and like chew sunflower seeds and then like just glare at you. Like if, if the yard itself didn't get you, the owner did. And, and you, you couldn't see past the surface, right? You didn't know like what this guy was interested in. You didn't know what he did for a living or, um, or if he scrapbooked on his spare time. Like you don't know. But you couldn't look past the surface, right? So you did all that you could to, to go around that house to avoid it. Jews viewed the Samaritans in the same way. Samaritans were a combination of both Jew and Gentile, right? They're half-breeds, um, for lack of a better term. And so Jews looked down on them, they shunned them, and they, they couldn't look past their heritage so that they did all they could too to avoid it. And the reason I tell you all these things because I want you un to understand that what Jesus does next is just straight up weird. Like Jesus and his disciples go through Samaria. That's weird. Nobody does that. Jews don't do that. But what I love about Jesus is he could care less how weird he looks. In fact, I feel like he aims to be weird sometimes, just to make us uncomfortable and to make us realize that the norms should be broken. And so here Jesus is with his disciples, and they're going through Samaria. It's the middle of the day, about noon. The sun is beating down on them. They're growing tired, and, and they're about to approach the city of Sychar. And Jesus grows weary. And so he, he's walking, and he's like, I just, I just need to rest my feet. So he, he rests beside a well. And his disciples continue onward, right? They continue, his disciples go into the city to get some food. So Jesus is by himself at this well, resting, probably just closing his eyes, rubbing the knots out of his feet. And then this woman shows up, the Samaritan woman. Can you imagine how shocked she was to see a man at the well, a Jewish man at this well? You see, she wasn't used to company at noon at the well, because this woman was different. Usually women would, would go early morning when it was cool outside, or in the evening when it was cooler, and they would, they would go together, right? And they would just gossip and chit-chat about life. But this woman, she was alone at the hottest part of the day, by herself at this well. Guys, I want you to understand that this whole situation is weird. Jesus walking through Samaria, that's weird. This woman being alone by herself at a well in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, that's weird. But what happens next blows my mind and gets this is even a little bit weirder. So Jesus is sitting there, this woman comes up, and I'm sure as she realized that he's a Jewish man, her, her eyes shift downwards and she tries to do everything that she needs to do and as quickly as possible just to get out of there, right? Just to, just to not talk to this man, not acknowledge him. He was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. 
people, they just didn't talk. So she's minding her own business, and, and Jesus does something that's weird. He looks up at the woman, and he says, give me a drink of your water. People didn't do that. Jews didn't do that. Giving a Samaritan woman as a Jewish man a drink of your water is like giving your snot-nosed little brother a huge slobbery lick of your ice cream cone. It's like letting your friend who notoriously backwashes their whole lunch every time that they eat, like every time they drink, taking a swig of your Mountain Dew. That's what it was like for a like, Jewish man to let a Samaritan like share water. It was seen as unclean. It was seen as dirty. Like, people just didn't do that. Jews just didn't do that. And so here Jesus is and says, give me a drink of your water. And this woman, I'm sure, like, she's minding her own business. She's shocked that he's even talking to her to begin with. Her, like, head snaps over and she looks at him as if to say, what, are you stupid? I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. Why on earth would you be asking for a drink from me? And Jesus continues onward with the conversation. He said, if only you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, then you, you would be the, asking, be the one asking for a drink, and he would give you living water. The woman is confused, because Jesus has this way of saying really confusing things. And she said, you have nothing to draw from a well. What do you mean? Where are you going to get this living water? And he says, everyone who drinks from this water, and glances over at her jar, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. This woman misunderstands him again and began thinking to herself, well, hot dog, this guy has water that will never make me thirsty again. I'll never have to walk up to this well. I'll never have to make this trip by myself at the hottest part of the day. Man, and he said, sir, please, like, give me some of this water, this water that will never make me thirsty. And Jesus pauses and says something that catches her completely off guard. Go call your husband and tell him to come here. The woman's face dropped. As she looked at Jesus, I don't have a husband. She began, to, I can imagine the girl may be a little defensive. You're right, he said, because you have had five husbands. And the one that you are currently living with, he isn't even your husband. The woman then began to ask Jesus questions. I mean, this stranger, this Jewish weird stranger, comes up to her, no idea anything about her, and says, Bring your husbands. Like, uncovering just the biggest sin in her life. This woman is obviously seeking something, seeking some sort of form of love and satisfaction, right? She's been through five boyfriends or five husbands and is currently living with one who's not even her husband. And here Jesus is this stranger who just comes up and blatantly tells her, this is the sin in your life. But he didn't do it in a rude or, like, abrasive way. In fact, the woman just kind of left it at that, but then she began to ask him questions, right? Of course, you're going to ask the stranger questions who just, like, told you everything that you want hidden, right? Or, like, everything that you're ashamed of. And they began to have this conversation, and this woman is, like, probing him about these, like, religious questions, about these, all of these different things. And then Jesus is answering them, is leading her, is, is moving in, in this conversation, and at the end of the conversation, Jesus says that it, it, none of that matters because, because there's one thing that does matter. And the woman said, um, I've heard of that there's this Messiah, that there's this Savior that's coming. And I can imagine this conversation going a little silent. As Jesus looks her in the eye and says, I am he who you speak of. Can you imagine the woman looking at him and her just, her tears welling up as she realizes that the man sitting in front of her, what he has to offer is the thing that's going to complete her. Is the thing that's going to completely change her life and transform her. This woman obviously is an outcast, right? 
Samaritans are an outcast of society to begin with, but people saw her sin. People saw that she was sleeping around with different men, living with them, and people shunned her. And an outcast of society had made her an outcast within it. So she was left to go retrieve water at a well by herself at the hottest part of the day. This woman had no friends, nobody. Obviously, the men she was seeking confinement in weren't doing anything because she's been through so many of them. Can you imagine a woman who's dealing with all of this, who went to the well that morning and expected to be there by herself, expected to be there all alone, again and again, to find a man who met her there, who, who said, I am he who you're looking for. I am he, and guys, we used to be the woman at the well, right? Even if you've grown up Christian your whole life, or if you haven't, there have been points in our life where we've been constantly seeking, constantly looking, constantly digging, right? And we try to find the answer to, to all of this with so many other things. Our story was hopeless. Our story was, was one that was, had nothing but a bad ending, right? We were constantly seeking purpose, and we were not finding in anything of this world. So what happens? We keep looking, we keep looking, we keep seeking, we keep seeking, we never find. We're on this endless cycle, and I can tell you this, and I know this because I've been through it myself. We, at times in our lives, were with that wound at the well all along, not knowing what direction to go, which way to go. And our seeking leads to us sinning. Right? Because we're trying to find the things that will fill us, and we try to find it in all of these things, and it leads us to sin. It's not like we're, we're trying to. I mean, sometimes that is the case. But we just want answers. And like the woman, she was seeking something, and, and she was trying to find it in men. Her story at this point is lonely and hopeless. But then something happens. Something absolutely incredible happens. This really cool dude named Jesus meets us where we're at. No matter how unclean we feel, no matter how much we've messed up, screwed up, or no matter how much we've even hurt other people, Jesus sits down next to us and meets us where we're at and says, Stop searching. Stop looking. Because everything you need is is right here, and I am he, what you're looking for. I am he. And he opens our eyes to the sin in our life. Not so we can feel like a terrible person. He opens up the sin in, opens up our eyes to the sin in our lives so that we can see that what we're, we're trying to find purpose in it was just only leading us a path, in a path to destruction. He opens up our eyes to the things that we try so desperately to fit into the cracks of our lives. And he doesn't do so in an abrasive way. He does it in the most lovely way possible. And the cool thing is he doesn't leave us at that, right? He doesn't just say, You're, there's this sin in your life. What are you going to do about it, right? No. He gives us an ending to our story. <laughs> he gives us an ending that is so full of hope. And so full of love and so full of grace, right? An ending to our hopeless and miserable story. Jesus gives us an ending. <laughs> he finishes the story. <laughs> and back back into scripture, right? So this woman, Jesus, like all he says is, I am he. <laughs> That's all he says. And this woman. She literally, like the disciples come back at this time, and they see Jesus talking to a woman, and they don't say anything out loud to him, but they're thinking, like, what is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman for? Like, who brought him out of the house? Like, seriously, what is Jesus doing? Like, they, they're embarrassed almost, because you just didn't talk to Samaritans. You just didn't do that. But here Jesus was being his weird self who doesn't do things like he's supposed to do them, and the disciples don't say anything. And the woman, like... I'm sure her eyes are locked on Jesus. The woman at this point takes off. She goes into the town. And what does she do? It says that she begins to share her story. She said, come, come see the man who showed me everything I've ever done. Come see this man. Come, he's at the well right now. Go meet him. Seriously, you've got to meet this guy. Go. And people are intrigued. People are interested. And what do they do? People start leaving their homes. 
home start putting down the things that they're currently doing, and they go to the well. And it's funny to me. I've never really realized this about scripture before, but, um, and I, it doesn't exactly say this, but I'm guessing that the, the city, the town that the disciples went in to get food was the same city that the woman went in, right? And you ask yourselves, okay, the disciples are supposed to be the ones that are closest to him, are they supposed to be the ones that are sharing the gospel. They had just gone into that city. They had just gone to that town. Why is it, why were they the ones saying, this woman, this woman, she, or, the, or this uh, man, this man is at this well right now. His name's Jesus. You have to meet him. Why weren't the disciples the one who did this? Why was it the woman who just came to know Jesus was the one who went into the city and shared her testimony and people, tons of people were coming to know him? Why? And it's funny because it says that while the woman is, is on fire and sharing the gospel in the city, while the woman is doing this, the disciples are talking to Jesus and he's have, giving them a lesson almost. <laughs> They're like, Jesus, we have food. Like, here's some food. Um, have something to eat. And he said, no, I have the food that I need to do the will of my father, right? And the disciples were like, misunderstood him. And he said, like, who gave him food already? Like, has he eaten, really eaten? And, and Jesus is like, no, no. The fields are white for harvesting. The seeds have been planted. People are ready to come to know Jesus. And it's funny because he says, look up. The fields are white with har for harvest. And I guarantee you people from the city at that point were coming to the well. Right? People were coming to the well because of the woman's testimony. And I think that, that this story in scripture doesn't just, just say something about the power of transformation in our story, but it says something about if we grow complacent with the story that God has given us. The disciples... Why, why weren't they the ones that were, were harvesting the field? Why weren't they the ones in the city sharing the gospel? Why this woman who just came to know Jesus, why was she the one who was going and telling and being passionate and sharing the gospel? And I, the disciples weren't disobeying. They were just ignorant and oblivious to the fact that people are ready right now to hear your story. Gosh, and whenever you hear a good ending, don't you just want to tell the whole world? Like an ending that shocks you, that throws you into disbelief. I don't know how many people I heard talk about the ending of How I Met Your Mother. Like how many people were just furious or just interested by it, but they had to literally tell everybody about it. Jesus has given us an ending to a story that's worth sharing. Let's get excited about it. Let's be like the woman and go into the town. Because guys, people are ready to come to know Jesus. You'll find that most people aren't sitting and, and hating and, and saying that there is no God, there is no this, there is no that. No, most people are just waiting to be invited. Gosh, the beauty of just a transformed life. And the cool thing is, these people, they ask Jesus, Jesus, stay with us a couple more days, right? Stay with us just a couple more days. And they, they told him. Like, it's not because of the woman's testimony anymore that we believe. We believe because we see now and we hear now. And it, it says in scripture, like, many people came to know him because of the woman's testimony. That's so stinking cool. That is so awesome. The ending of the story is worth sharing. The ending of your story is worth telling the world. Your story, your story of a transformed life. And my dear friends, if you get anything out of today, let it be this. Our stories are all similar. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all have these stories of our imperfections and our mess-ups. We all have them. So don't compare yourself to the next person because Scripture says we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Our stories up until that point are hopeless and lonely. Our stories have this terrible ending, but let me tell you this. We get an ending to our hopeless story. We get an ending of hope, of love, of grace. We get an ending to our story. An ending that speaks of all of these things. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not be trapped in 
darkness no longer will stop searching, but have eternal life. We have hope. We have hope that despite our imperfections and despite our mess-ups, despite the things that we've done to other people, the things that we've done to ourselves, despite all of these things that made us feel like absolutely terrible people, despite these things, we are forgiven. And Jesus gives us an end to our hopeless story. Guys, let me tell you that he is enough. His love quenches any thirst that we have. And friends, sometimes you sit back and you say, where is God right now? Where is he at? I don't see him, I don't feel him, I don't see him moving. But let me tell you this, God's power, God's love, God's presence, his forgiveness and grace is not best seen in miracles or big, a big booming voice from the sky or best seen in these huge dramatic, dramatic events. Yes, God can be seen through those things, but God can best be seen moving through the transformation of lives, the transformation of your life. Do you wonder why Paul is such a huge character in the New Testament, why he wrote so many of the books? This man was the perfect picture of God's life transforming power. A man who used to hate murder was full of this rage. It's rage transformed into this guy who loved like crazy, who shared the gospel, even giving his life for it. God can be seen best through the transformation of your lives. So guys, I want you to just take a moment to think back, right? Or do you remember when you were sitting at that well? Do you remember when Jesus met you there, when you were alone in your brokenness and disparity and hopelessness? Do you remember when Jesus sat down beside you and opened up your eyes to the things in your life that weren't doing you any good, opening up your eyes to your own destruction and your own sin? Do you remember when he told you, you don't have to search anymore? You don't have to search anymore because I am he. I am what you're looking for. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember that time? Remember when Jesus changed your life. Remember when Jesus transformed you from the person that you were into the person that you are today and continually transforms you. Remember, my friends, and by all means, tell the world the end to your story. And don't grow complacent about it and don't push it off like it's something that's not important but because people need to hear. There are people right now who are lonely and sitting at the well who just need somebody to come sit down next to them and be like, here, let me just love you where you're at. People desperately need to hear the end of the story because to them, the story has no end. To them, their story is a constant cycle of hopelessness and abandonment. And, and, and guys, they need to hear the end to the story. A story an end to the story that doesn't say a thing about how awesome you are. An end to the story that says everything about how unbelievably awesome that he is. And how much he loves. And how he's so good. Jesus have, has given you one heck of a story. And an ending that has a bang. So by all means, my friends, tell it. Live it. Guys, he is all that you need. I promise you that. And he's all that we all need. So be quick to tell that story of yours. Be quick to tell that ending. Jesus is moving. And he's constantly changing and transforming lives. And it's up to you whether or not you take part in that transformation. And you take part because this is, this is serious business. And yeah, I, I like to have fun and I like to be a goofball, but when it comes down to the end of the day, people's lives are on the line. People's lives are on the line. Do you want to take part in sitting down next to someone who's so lost and that telling them the end of the story, they, they just want to go off and tell the whole world? You have that opportunity. You have that chance. 
to share with the world and end it to this story. Will you guys pray with me? Um, dear Heavenly Father, <laughs> um, thank you for giving me this opportunity even though I'm a hot mess 99.9% of the time. God, you are so unbelievably beautiful and I sit every day in amazement of who you are, God. I love you. We love you. And God, I pray that you just fill us today and help us to just see that you are moving and to see that you are transforming lives, God, and give us passion for your story. Give us passion for the ending of the story, God. I pray that we're quick to tell people, hey, this is how my life used to be, but this is what it's like now because of you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sitting down next to the well beside me and for just pointing out to me that the life that I'm leading is a life of destruction. God, thank you. I pray that you soften our heart and hearts and that you shift our perspective and help us to see the ultimate goal. Help us to see the ultimate ending of the story. Help us to see what it's really about and what really matters. Let us wake up every single day and say, God, this day is yours. Let us wake up every single day and say, God, who can I love today? Who can I encourage today? Who can I build up today? God, who can I just invite to coffee today? Who can I just sit down and watch a movie with? Who needs investing in? Who needs your love, God, and your grace and forgiveness? Let us wake up every day and give it to you. God, I know that people are stressed. I know that people have busy schedules and they don't know how to get by. They don't know how to just find joy in this, the tedious schedule that they have. But God, help us to just find a new way to live our lives. Where we're giving it over to you because, God, we want people to come to find you. We want people to see your face. We want people to fall in love with you because, God, you are what we need. You have what we need, God, and you are just so incredibly beautiful, God. Thank you for who you are, God, for moving in my life, for transforming me, for bringing me to this moment right here, right now. And, God, I pray that you are moving in the hearts of the students on this campus. God, let us grow passionate about you to go out and just want to change the world, not to get up, give ourselves attention, not to give ourselves glory, but to change the world because we want you to get the glory. We want you to get the attention. We want people to see your face. Let our transformed lives reflect you, Jesus. God, we love you. We love you. We love you. And let us go out of this room today being full of love and full of excitement because we know the end to the story. Let us live lives, transform lives for you. God, we love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.